Hold it. Deuteronomy 34. Hear God's word. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to the mount, to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which faces Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the plain in the valley in the Jer of, the, of Jericho. Sorry. Sorry. All of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of Pars, as far as Zohar. The Lord said to him, This is the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you will not cross into it. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. He buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, facing Beth Peor. And no one to this day knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak, and his validity and his valid validity had not left him. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. Then that when the days of weeping and mourning for Moses came to an end, Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid hands on him. So the Israelites obeyed him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. No prophet has risen against again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his officials and all his land, and for all the mighty acts of power and terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. May God praise his word. <clears throat> As we get into this passage this morning, one of the things that is striking and that actually stands out for us is that Moses is at the center of this closing narrative as we come to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And as the book comes to a close, one of the other things that is noticeable about this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 34, is that Moses' own life and ministry, in a sense, in a real sense, come to a close. His own life and ministry come to a close. And what we find in this very short passage is his entire life and ministry coming to a culmination Everything that he has worked for, everything that God has done in the life of this man ever since he was a baby, by saving and preserving his life, has led up to this moment. It's a defining moment in his life. And the amazing thing that this passage does is, instead of just focusing on Moses, it actually does an incredible thing by focusing on Moses in the context of everything that God has done in the history of the life of his people. And so you don't just get a glimpse of Moses the man, but you get a glimpse of the, the man, the Moses the man, in the context of what God has been doing in the life of his people. And though he doesn't state it this way, but it, it comes to that, to that, to that meaning when, when he talks about the land. And we can always see this, it's always coming from the land, from the time that God had cursed the land and all of creation ever since the fall of Adam, when God made the promises to, to the patriarchs and said, basically, when you enter into this land, you will be in a kind of new Eden. Well, I will dwell with you and I will again be your God. You see, the promise that God has made to the patriarchs, and that promise all the way goes back to Genesis 3 and the 4. 
We see and we read about the Exodus, God's exploits in the Exodus. And Moses, again, stands at the center of all of that. And in the midst of that, we have a future that is uncertain, but in God's mind is certain that is spanned out for us. And I believe the man of God, as he thinks about this, he has a lot of things on his mind as he thinks about that future. And we'll get into that in a second. We're beginning a new sermon series this morning titled, The Finish Line. And the idea around that title is basically to, to echo this, this concept of finishing, beginning and finishing well. How do we do that? It's a new year. I think it's a fitting theme as we get into this new year, the finish line. What does that look like for us? What does that look like for us? I don't know how you feel about New Year's resolutions. Maybe you're like me. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not big on them. I don't really make them. Uh, my wife makes us make them when we sit down and think about the year and pray because she loves praying and I love praying. Um, but I think she has a gift of prayer. Um, I don't know what you feel or make about them, but I think as a human being, I can relate with this idea that um, we all want to finish well, regardless of what it is. I don't know what you've planned for this year. Maybe one of the things that you've set up for yourself is, you know, I, I'm going to save up money. And for me to finish this year well may mean to go to that vacation. Maybe it's Springbok. I don't know. But God works in mysterious ways. And, and you've encountered people from, from there and you've just thought, man, I love these people. I want to go to the place where God produces these people. And you, uh, not that I know anything about it, but you, you can go wherever you want to go. Maybe it's a little bit more serious. Maybe it's a resolution for you year in and year out when you think about your relationship with your dad. When you think about your relationship with your mom. When you think about the relationship that they had with one another and you look at your kid and you think, and you look at your marriage and the, the thing that comes to mind is whatever happens, I can fail in any area of life, but this is my goal. If I can nail this with my kid, I didn't have this with my dad, I didn't have this with my mom, but if I can get this right in life, no matter what comes, life will be well. It will be kudos. Whatever that looks like for you, I know we all have a sense of that. Our passage this morning is divided into four main sections. We're going to focus on three of those. I'm going to kind of jump into the one, but not really focus on the one because of time. And what I want us to do as we walk through this passage this morning is that I hope that as we delve into each one of these scenes, we can get some principles that will help us to get to the finish line. As we learn from what God is doing in the life of this man Moses has been doing and is saying in this very moment, we can learn a few things that will help us to end well. Whatever that looks like, in the, whatever sphere you find yourself in, we can do that well. Look at verse 1 to verse 4. The first thing the passage tells us is that God shows Moses the land that he had promised to the patriarchs, to his ancestors. That's the first scene that we introduce us. That we introduce to God showing Moses the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses, presumably alone, in obedience to God, sets out to climb this mountain. From the plains of Moab, he summits to, ne to, to, to the Mount of Nebo. And from there, Moses has this panorama view of the land that is supposed to be inherited by the children of Israel. And he sees it. Chapter 3 verse 25 tells us that Moses had an expectation to enter the land himself. I've read many Christian commentators and many of them focus on this idea of Moses' obedience. But I think we miss chapter 3 verse 25 when we hear Moses' own feelings about him not being able to enter the land. He says, I pleaded with God that I would be able to enter. And he said, no. He goes as far as to say in verse 26 of chapter 3, he turns around and he says, because of you people, that I cannot enter the land. So there's a deep desire for Moses to really be in the land. But you read chapter 34 and you realize as Moses summits, I don't know if he was alone or if he went with people, I assume he was alone, but as Moses summits that mountain at age 120, he had one thing that he treasured above all things in his life. 
And if you read the passages just before chapter 34, if you read chapter 32 to, 30, um, to 33, when he sings the song to God and when he prays blessings upon the nations or, or the children of Israel and all their clans, the one thing that comes out time and time again is that Moses had a desire and treasured this one thing above all else and that was to be and to walk in obedience with his God. And so even though in his flesh he kicked against walking up that mountain because he knew what was waiting for him, Moses walked in obedience to his Savior because he trusted him. He trusted him. However painful he felt in his flesh. In chapter 32, the only thing Moses told is go up there and die and die. But one of the remarkable things about what happens when Moses finally summons the mountain is like any good father. You know, my only and I, when, whenever we, we send a lady to Naughty Corner, guess what is the conversation about? It's five minutes. What is the conversation about for the entire five minutes? Don't you think it's time for her to come out? It's been a minute. It's been two minutes. It's been three minutes. What, what are we going to say whenever she comes out? And so sending her away and kind of, you know, disciplining her, it, it's never just that. There's, there's often more to that. And you almost see this fatherly heart of Moses, of God coming out. As he sends Moses up, like, you've been naughty. Go up to the naughty corner and you're going to die up there. Moses gets there and God says, let me show you your Christmas presents. I want you to open them up. And God does two things for Moses. He says, I want to show you something in verse 1. And in verse 4, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. Verse 1, he says, God showed Moses. God showed Moses. And I think there's an important spiritual uh, principle that we can learn from what God showed Moses. The first thing God tells, does, he shows Moses is the land. And he does it in a very unique way. He shows Moses the land that his people would inherit and he names them by the clans that they would inherit it. Remember, they have not entered the land. It's not theirs yet. And God says, this is where so-and-so is going to stay. This is where so-and-so is going to stay. And if you turn to this side, this is where so-and-so is going to stay. And Moses began to have a smile. I imagine. At least. And God shows him this hand. And I think at this moment, that old man, as he stood there, one of the thoughts that certainly dawned on me was this thought as Moses looked at this. I may not be able to enter. However, nothing given or not everything given to believers is a possession to be acquired immediately. Get that? Not everything given to believers is a possession to be acquired immediately. That is probably one of the things that he had in mind. As he stood there. They're going to get it. I may not get it. But, but I know. If I'm obedient. He said that there's a land coming. You know many people. And many Christians. Scoff against this idea. And so what they do. Is they devise new plans. New doctrines. That would circumvent God's ways. Name it and claim it. Prosperity gospel. Moses didn't stand there. And say to God. No, no, no. I don't like what you're saying. And I declare. I decree. That I will enter that land. I cherish and I love the doctrine and the, or the Christian virtue of contemplate. James, sorry, Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. He says, there is treasure, there is an inheritance stored up for us in heaven and that you will only get when you get to heaven. I think Moses understood this. I think Moses knew this. That's lesson number one. Paul comes on another scene and I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul comes and he says something that actually I struggle with. I struggle with. There's somebody who, 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 who thinks about uh, social and biblical justice all the time. Paul, Paul comes and, and he says to, to slaves and he says to the unmarried. And if you're not married, you're going to feel with me this thing. He, he says to both those groups, in your situation, let not that I struggle with that. No, 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 no. What do you mean? The slave, he must not be troubled by his circumstances. Then he continues and he says, listen, there are things that are way more important than the circumstance that you're going through. And that thing is your obedience to God. In the situation that God has called you, remain in it. By the way, slave, if you can get your freedom, get your freedom. Married person, if you can get it, get married. 
That's, I'm, not, I'm not against marriage, and I'm not against people getting their freedom from slavery. But here's the thing. Are you obedient in the context and situation that God has called you? That is of utmost importance about the situation that you find yourself in. That's what Paul tells these people. Moses, when he looked at his situation, that is the thing that he probably had in mind. And so when he summoned to that mountain, he had peace in his heart because he treasured that above everything else. Being obedient to God. Being obedient to God. One of the other things we told is that Moses was 120 years old when he summoned at the mountain. 120 years old. When he saw the land. 120 years old. It's a land that his quote-unquote children would inherit. The children of Israel, people that he has led all his life, people he has led all his life. I, I, like any good parent, I think one of the things that probably went on Moses' mind, went deep into Moses' mind, that made uh, him say the words that he said in chapter 3, verse 25, was this reality. I think it's a lesson for parents, for couples, whether you're married or not married, for singles and for Christian leaders. It's a good lesson in this. You can only do what God has called you to do. I'm sure as the plane was in front of him and he turned back and he saw the people camped behind the mountain and in front of him, there's the land in front of him. He knew these people. They are the reason that he cannot go in. They grumbled and they murmured and he was thinking, I don't know if they're going to make it. Maybe if I go with them, they will be okay. And it was tough for him. It was tough for him. I, I spoke to many of you and I told you this thing about, about a parent that I met in Constantia while standing in the queue. And he said to me, Dave, you know what? I visited a, a church and I took a look for them. And he said, and I asked him like, dude, how has this Christian journey been for you? And he said, you know what? In parenting, one of the things that I regret the most, I, I bless the Lord and I thank the Lord that I have money and I have wealth and I have property and I can leave all that stuff for my kids. And I'm a gospel man. I have labored day and night, not just in front of people, but in my home to give my children the gospel so that they can treasure the truths of who God is in His Son, Jesus. But you know the one thing that I regret the most? I haven't prayed for them enough. Because not a single one of them are walking with the Lord. And we're having a dinner this evening. And like every parent, I don't even think it's a Christian thing. Even if you are a Christian and your kids walk with Jesus, guys, if you're dating somebody or you're with somebody, for a dad, that person is never make it. I'm the standard. And if he can't meet my standard, there's no other standard. Um, and he said, they're coming over for dinner and, 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 and I don't like this guy, man. And I remember that and I, and I thought about that when he said about prayer. You know what he was saying about prayer? I have done everything in my power possibly to impart gospel truth in them, but I haven't trusted God enough to do the things that I wasn't able to do. Numbers 27 verse 18, when Joshua comes in Moses' sort of view, the scripture says that Moses, or that, that Joshua, had a spirit of wisdom before Moses laid hands on him. What does that mean? God was at work in the life of this young man before Moses did what he did in walking with this man. There are things that God can do that you and I cannot do. And we need to leave that to God. But we need to be faithful in stewarding what God has given us to do. That is something that we can take from, uh, from, this, from, from this man's life this year. That is beginning and ending well. Do what you have to do and leave the rest in God's hand. And submit all that stuff to pray. Submit all that stuff to pray. Moses also saw, uh, sorry not just besides seeing, Moses also heard the promises of God. God just didn't show him, but God, but God, God spoke to him in verse 4. And the last words Moses heard was this. This is the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. It was only when Moses heard those words, 
God showed him the land and said, that's that so-and-so's presence and that's so-and-so's portion. And I'm sure that he's like, okay, okay, but, but, but how do I know they will get it if I'm not going with them? God said to him, I will stand behind my promise. And that gave him peace. That gave him peace. Because I'm sure as he was standing there, he was thinking about his whole life. About his marriage, when Miriam, his brother and sister, came against his marriage and said, you know, you married a, a Kushite woman. Those are the people who oppressed us in Egypt, and you dare marry one of their women? When the people grumbled against him, and Moses felt like giving up, the thing that kept him was the word and promises of God. Above all else, there was a massive cloud in front of them. They saw that and they didn't, the fear of God did not grip them. The fear of God did not grip them. It didn't give them peace that God was with them. But at every moment, the thing that held this nation, the thing that held Moses was the words of promise of God. It is a promise that a servant of God, Job, saw. At the end of his life in Job 42 verse 5, Job had gone through what he had gone through. Job turns around and God speaks to Job in a cloud. And you know what Job says in verse 5, 42 verse 5? Job says, I have heard about you, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Because God spoke to him. It's a promise that he held. Even in chapter 19, when his flesh was getting away. You know what Job said? In this body that is dying, that is being eaten away by worms while I'm alive, in this body I will stand on this earth and I will see God for myself. With my own two eyes, I will see Him. And that's what He treasured above everything because that's what the promises of God revealed. It didn't say to Moses, you will enter only. It said to Moses, this is who I am. I am faithful. I am faithful. This year, my prayer for you is this. My prayer for you is this. Delight yourself in the word of God. Delight yourself in the promises of God. There's no better way to begin and end this year well. Paul comes and says to, um, what is it? To, to young Timothy, he says to him this. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things. Promising, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And the life to come. Give yourself to God. There is great reward and there is great promise in that. You know, one of the remarkable things that I love about the Bible is that, and about God's character and nature is, years later, on the Mount of Transfiguration, God said to him, you will never enter the land. Years later, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was transformed, who stood next, who stood next to him? Who stood next to him? How faithful. You know what? The greatest thing that he treasured above everything. He was standing on the land, but he didn't go, I'm here, guys, I'm here. You know what he did? He turned to Jesus and he said, I've been longing to see you my whole life. And I'm seeing you face to face. And he stood in the presence of his God, Jesus Christ. That's the God that he served. We're moving on to his death. We're going to move a little bit faster. Verse 5 to verse 8. Moses' death is not no fanfare. Moses' death is no fanfare. There's no explanation, and there's a lot of debate whether Moses went up the mountain with a couple of servants, he settled there in an old age, eventually he died, or whether God just smit him, or whatever happened, the Bible doesn't say. It doesn't explain. It doesn't maybe he was taken up like Elijah. The Bible doesn't say. We don't want to speculate. We don't want to speculate. What we know is that he went up there and he died. And I think the point of that is so that we can move past this is to give us the sense that Moses' life was not a tragedy. Whatever you make of this death, however tragic death is, this life was no tragedy. Friends, any life lived in God and for God is not a waste. No matter how it comes to an end. There are people in countries who are giving their lives to Jesus and are being martyred. And those lives, whole families, are not wasted. Because they are lived in God. They are lived in God. Moses knew this. The writer of Hebrews comes in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 24 to verse 28. He comes on the scene and he says, listen, Moses could have married Pharaoh's daughter 
potentially becoming the next Pharaoh. There was women lined up on his, on his doorstep. There was, there was wealth and there was riches, but he gave up the pleasures of this life in Egypt because there was a greater thing on his way. Moses at one point pursued the purposes of God by killing a human being, an Egyptian, because he thought that he could pursue the purposes of God and, you know, stand in the gap and, and, and pursue that social justice uh, initiative because, 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 because my people need to be delivered. And he gave that method of doing things up. I think it's a problem, and not a problem, but I think it's a mistake that many young people make today. They run and they have good causes in mind, but they run without God. They love the young people who say, you know, I'm going to live my life and I'm going to give the, the better days of my life to, 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 to smoking and drinking and girls and all these things and guys. And, and eventually, because church and religion works like this. As long as I'm going to church, my place in heaven is secure. And they waste their life. And you know what happens? For many of them, verse 7 is not their portion. Not because they may, they may not see verse 7. In their old years, 120 years, they can look back and say, the Lord has been good. The Lord has been good. What Moses teaches us is if you live a life for and in God, there is great reward. That's exactly what Paul says to Timothy. You can give yourself to fleshly things, to, to building yourself up and, and getting yourself well. It, 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 it only has limited value. But if you invest yourself in godliness this year, there's great promise, uh, Paul says to Timothy. There's promise for this life and there's promise in the life to come. You know, I in Leavenly Hill have sit and sat and listened to so many funerals of gangsters and mothers and dads struggle to say something good at a certain point of their age. They can only talk about pity as long as he was, you know, when he was born. He was such a good boy in school. And then something happened. Because they've given their lives to something else. They've given their lives to something else. And they've wasted their lives. They've wasted their lives. If you give yourself to the things of God, I promise you there's great reward this year. You will have a funeral like, like him. I mean, a month funeral. Black people have a funeral for a week. And it's coffee, and it's slaughtering, and it's, and it's, and it's meat, and it's, and it's texting on your pocket. But imagine a month. People have nothing but good stuff to say. And then you move all the way from to verse, verse 10 to verse 12. They have all that stuff to say about you, and nobody is lying. Nobody's lying. Just don't ask my wife to speak at my funeral. This, this, everything else can work out. You know? Choose to serve God this year. There is no greater way than to begin and to end well this year. Serve God. And if you get stuck, and if you don't know what mess I'm in, and I don't know, because the Bible is not clear about do I turn left or right, ask one question. Does this serve God? Doesn't stick Walk away. The last point. Moses' legacy, verse 10 to verse 12. I didn't focus on Joshua. That's the one I left out because I mentioned him earlier. Moses' legacy, verse 10 to verse 12. The passage closes with Moses on this grand stage. He's incomparable. His incomparability. There's no prophet like him. But at the same time, we must hold that sentence that there's no prophet like him in tension with the fact that Moses was buried in an unmarked grave. We must hold both those things together. And here's why. Here's why. We must honor the man Moses. We must honor men and women who serve God faithfully, whether they are behind the pulpit, whether it's your mom and dad who has labored before the Lord and led this family well and has raised you up in the ways of the Lord, whatever they may, that may look. Sometimes your mom and dad are not even Christian, but God uses them powerfully. And get, I think there's still honor in that. There's still honor in that. But we must not fail in the area of idolatry. You know, John Calvin, a great reformer, came and he had the same thing when he was buried. You know what he said? I want no tomb 
at my gravestone, at my gravesite. No tomb. There's no landmark that marks how Calvin lives here or died here, is buried here. Because I think Calvin knew a sense of his fame. A lot of Christians, when they engage with other believers, especially if those who are still in the trappings of prosperity gospel, you know what the first question is I found many believers ask? Are you a Calvinist? Are you reformed? Friends, there's no title on this planet greater than Christian. Do they know and love Jesus? The rest we will iron out with discipleship. Calvinism is not the standard. It is beautiful and it is amazing. And I'm proud to call myself a, Calvin, a Calvinist. But I also know this man. He said, no gravestone for me. You will not make of me more than what I was a man. Jude 9 records a dispute over the body of Moses between the devil and the archangel Michael. And I think I know why that dispute was going on. I think the devil was saying, give the body to the people. Let them have a wonderful funeral. King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah in, in 2 Kings 18 verse 4. Had a problem with the people of Israel. You know what that problem was? Remember that bronze snake that Moses lifted up in the desert? 2 Kings 18 verse 4 said they started to burn incense to that thing. They made it a god. Now what do you think they would have made with Moses' body when God said in Exodus 7 verse 1, you will be like a god to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. What do you think they would have made to his body? They would have worshipped the man. They would have made him a god. God removed him. I will not share my glory with no other. And so what is our tendency? We make out of good things that God has given us idols. That's what we do. And so here's a New Year's resolution. If you want to begin this year, end this year well, be weary of idolatry. In this particular area, be weary of making, when you're in conversation with a non-Christian, making your theology, making your church more than you make about the gospel. Be weary of that. And here's bringing me to Jesus. I'm really coming to a close. Bring this to Jesus. Moses' incomparability needs to be set alongside Deuteronomy 18 verse 5 because he himself promised there is one coming after me who is like me. Who saw God face to face, who engaged with God face to face. And that person is no other than Jesus Christ. No other than Jesus Christ. It is him and him alone that we ultimately imitate. It is him and him alone that we ultimately worship. Moses died, according to the word of the Lord, outside of the land, because he broke faith. Because he was unfaithful to God. Chapter 32, Deuteronomy verse 51 says, He broke faith with God and he was not holy in the presence of the people in God's sight. Jesus died, the writer of Hebrews chapter 13 says, Jesus died outside of the city gates because he was faithful. Perfect man in humble obedience, submitting to God in the presence of all man, faithfully walking up that mountain, summiting that mountain, and dying for the sins of the world, something that Moses can never do. And his grave site and his burial is not hidden. We talk about it because through him, you and I can have the joys that Moses is experiencing right now in the presence of God. If you're going to end this year well, if you're going to begin this year well, do it the way Moses did. In submission, in humble obedience, through faith in the promise that holds for us and for all of those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. That's my hope for you. That's my hope. So whatever I've been saying, be weary of idolatry this year. Preach the gospel. You are a Christian above all else. First, labor in prayer. Trust in God for your kids, for your ministry, for your relationship, for your marriage, for everything because you can only take them so far. There's things that God can do that you cannot do. And the last thing, give yourself to Scripture. 
Because in them you will see God. You will see God. I have an amazing illustration. Sorry, I'm punching my own thing. But it's actually from Jesus. Jesus had this thing and said, Whose money, whose face is on this one? Caesar's. It's stuck in the Caesar. What does Jesus say? Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. This year, pay your taxes. Please be faithful. But when you look next to you, what do you see? You see the image of God. Give to God what belongs to God. Doing all these things at the end of the day has to flow out in actual life. Don't idolize anything else. Don't make of anything else more than you should. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, and, and, and we, we, we rejoice in your word, in the knowledge that your word is beautiful, that you are an amazing God. As we set out this year to, to, to invest in your things, to see our ministry grow, grow, to see our ministry flourish, to see our families grow and flourish, to see ourselves stepping in the way and the things of God, and, and doing and being what God, sorry, what God has called them to be. Father, I pray above all things that we be weary of idolatry. Give ourselves to prayer, trust in Jesus, give ourselves to the Word of God, and labor in it so that we can see you anew in our flesh. We pray these things for Jesus' sake.